everyone, I'm Kevin, I'll wave someone's forum, BX257, here with you with another 1980s and 90s G.I. Joe tour review. And today I'll be taking a look at the G.I. Joe's Heavy Ordnance Trooper, the 1991 Heavy Duty. Heavy Duty makes his first comic book appearance in the old Marvel comic run of G.I. Joe, issue number 130, and makes his first animated appearance in the Deke animated episode titled Injustice and the Cobra Way. One thing that I always found very interesting about the Heavy Duty uh, character is how popular he is. Now, don't get me wrong on that. I think he deserves it because he has a very, uh, very interesting and very memorable design as well as very interesting accessories. But the fact of the matter is, is that when you think of like mainline G.I. Joe characters, secondary and even tertiary characters, you're still thinking of characters that were originally designed in 1982 to 1987. And yet we skip all of that to 1991 and we have Heavy Duty, who is such a popular character that he's included in the 2009 live action G.I. Joe movie. But why is that? Why did this character click when so many other characters that were created between 1990 to 1994 just didn't? Taking a look at Heavy Duty's accessories first, he actually has one large accessory which is known as the Man Portable Heavy Weapon System. Its eight pieces actually fitted all together and then around the figure. Normally I just take off a particular accessory and take a look at it individually, but seeing as this is all one item, I'll have to take a look at this as if it were a vehicle rather than a figure. First we have the Missile Sight, which is this red sight which just goes over his face. This is actually the most fragile piece of the whole weapon system. This clear plastic actually moves out of the way like that and that's actually as far as you can pivot it. It just, uh, like I said, goes over the eye here. It actually has a very unusual uh, sculpt to how it's pinned in. You can see it's a sort of zigzag like that. So when you swivel it around, that zigzag opens up and that's as far down as it goes. On the front here, we have a Gatling gun in the middle and two side cannons beside that. There's a lot of really nice detail on the top. It's rather unfortunate that these don't move. I mean, the whole, as it's hooked up to the whole figure, uh, the figure itself can actually uh, rotate and swivel around. But what I mean by that is that it's, it's a shame that this doesn't recoil or spin around on this base. And speaking of the base, you notice on the front where I'm assuming where the ammunition for all this goes, you have a really nice detailed uh, undercarriage here, which just says, um, just try it. Very, uh, very aggressive attitude printed on there. But it also has really nice little bullet holes all over it. It's really interesting that they didn't leave that clean. So it's as if this guy has just come back from battle. On the side here, we have two spring-loaded missiles with two missiles on either side. So we just have these little triggers here on this thing. Fires out quite fast. I'm actually kind of surprised at how powerful these tiny little missile launchers are. On top, we have little hand holds so he can control all this stuff. And on the back, the actual, uh, this old harness part where it's hanging on to the missile launchers is actually held on by this uh, long rod here. And it has a C-clip onto the backpack. Now you would think that with, um, with an arrangement like this, it would be a natural hinge. But because it's so close to the body, you can't actually move any of this stuff. You really do have to move the figure around in order to get any type of articulation out of which direction that you're pointing your weapons. But the backpack itself has a lot of very interesting details. Of course, you have a little 
tech details on top, but you also have a bunch of grenades and a spare, me uh, spare gun here. Now, as I said, this originally came in eight pieces, which you, as a kid back in 1991, would have had to have put together using this, well, probably one of the most complex instruction sheets printed on the back of a figure that I've ever seen. It seems like it would have been more comfortable if it were a bit higher, like on his stomach or sort of chest level, but it isn't. And that's unfortunately not adjustable because of how this thing attaches. If you don't really like how low the whole heavy weapon system is on the figure, I have discovered there is one little cheat. By disconnecting the backpack, you can actually reconnect it in the opposite order and just have the figure holding up the rest of the heavy weapon system without the aid of the backpack. It looks a little funny from behind, but from the forwards, it looks very natural. Even though this guy, in my opinion, encapsulates the 1990s, I think it does it so well that I actually really like him. Now, he has such a complicated uh, weapon system, you would think that they wouldn't just really do much with the figure itself, and I've seen that before. But in this case, they've given him a lot of great details, and I actually really like the color scheme that they've gone with here. I know a lot of people complain about the bright green hat and the camouflage, but I think it complements them really well because they balanced it with a tan shirt and dark green and brown here. So it's not really as jarring as I think some people just sort of make it out to be. It's um, At least it goes with the dark green and the bright green of the missiles here. And yeah, this is just triangles and you don't generally have um, camo that has triangles. It kind of reminds me of guacamole flavored Doritos. And I think I've actually mentioned that before. But honestly, it's an attempt at uh, camouflage and at the figure's scale, it actually looks good. Like if this were a a 12 inch 1 6 scale figure I think it would probably not look as good as this and it definitely wouldn't look as good on a real person's pants. And then we have the backwards cap. Yeah he's got that backwards cap but you also have to remember that this thing came with a sight which came down over his face so his backwards cap actually isn't really so much as a fashion choice as it is a necessity for to get the peak out of the way so this will knock his hat off when the sight comes down yeah he's got a ripped shirt ripped sleeves so yeah there's that wild card 1988 i believe wild card figure which came with the mean dog that guy had rips all over his outfit and nobody complains about that and then there's stuff like the double tattoo, which are Cobra symbols crossed out. It's kind of, kind of like the um, no smoking or anti-drug things of the 1990s. I don't know why he has two of them on here, but well, that's a thing. And then he has things like the Joe printed right on there. Like normally this would be G.I. Joe, but it's just abbreviated to just plain Joe. And that's like any old trucker cap, really. It doesn't look very military at all. But again, I don't really mind it because it's behind his head. But then you have the, th the sort of thing repeated here on his belt buckle. And then people say, well, he's got Joe all over him. He's trying to prove that he's a Joe. He's got anti-Cobra stuff. But then again, He's not the first figure to come with the abbreviated Joe on his belt buckle. That's actually 1990s updraft, a uh, figure who piloted the Retaliator helicopter. Another guy who looked all business, and yet he had that on his, uh, on his belt buckle. Again, it's not the first time we get G.I. Joe on here, but certainly the one of the few times we get the abbreviated, more sort of friendly, attitude written, just Joe. But he is also kind of business as well. He's not just all fashion. You know, he's got a little knife and 
grenades and things like that on him, so. He is hard to mistake for anything other than a soldier. Heavy Duty's face sculpt is actually rather neutral. It's not overly angry or overly smiley. But it's not really just plain either. You can definitely see that he is just sort of, well, pensive or something like that. Oddly enough, in the cartoon, he was clean-shaven, which gave him a much younger look. Here, with the mustache and, well, I actually have to say, uh, you know, kind of high cheekbones and just sort of a, a slightly angular jawline there, he does look a bit older, which to me, again, I kind of like because then it sort of uh, excuses away some of his uh, fashion choices here. So he's not just some young guy, you know, um, keeping up with the trends. He's someone who's actually given some thought to what he's put on his body here. The Falkar doesn't really mention exactly what service he really provides here. Artillery is just sort of generic. Is he anti-tank? Anti-aircraft? Is he a defender? I mean, with missiles and cannons, he's sort of obviously a support guy rather than a frontline fighter. But exactly what is he supposed to be the counter to? And I'm not really sure what service he's in, but there are quite a few figures which have a lot of the same features at least. Of course, we have the 1990 Rampart, who was a shore defender, who came with both a... Uh, small missile launcher, as well as a cannon. A lot of people tend to think of that as a machine gun, but it is actually a cannon. So there's that role that Heavy Duty can fill. There's also things like the 1990 Drop Zone, who is also a figure which had a weapon which is literally harnessed to his body. So there's also that, sort of a mobile artillery. Of course, Heavy Duty is fighting against Cobra, which has a lot of exotic weaponry. So, of course, you can't really expect him to be uh, sort of grounded in reality. I mean, nothing on him is realistic, let's face it. Even though it looks quite mechanical and quite reasonable to build, uh, no military in the world is actually walking around with these things strapped to their waists. So, exactly who would he be the counter for? On the Cobra side, well, easily I would say that he is the counter to the new 1991 Bats, who have these large missile launchers, as well as grenade launchers. So, these guys are in a sort of a, a very long-range battle. And there's also the 1991 Crimson Guard Immortals, who also had a machine gun, as well as these multiple tiny rocket launchers. If you're looking for a heavy duty on the aftermarket, and if you're like me who is kind of still sort of a 1980 snob who is reluctant to add 1990 figures to their collection, you've got to at least add heavy duty to your collection. He is pretty much the principal 1990s figure that you should have in your collection. It may be a little bit difficult with all the pieces that his accessory well, sort of entails, and yes, I do use accessory as a singular, even though it comes apart in all these little bits and pieces. One, actually, beyond the sight almost always having been missing, or the sight peg being broken off because, you know, it's a tiny little clear plastic thing, which for, I don't really know why they have a little stop here to prevent you from over you know, over-articulating it, because all a kid would wind up doing is over-articulating it anyway, and thinking that, oh, well, it's just stuck. It's not supposed to have actually a stopper there, and over-twist it and crack the whole thing off. Quite frankly, I think that's what's going on whenever you see one of these with a broken peg. It just, to me, it doesn't really make much sense why there's a stopper there. But the other thing that you do have to look out for, and I don't think I actually mentioned this, is the fact that the handlebars are actually quite tiny and thin. So that's something that you really should be looking for on the aftermarket, is whether the handlebars are still there, because they can be a little bit hard to see. Now, one thing you don't really have to look out for are the missiles, because 
Despite the fact that missiles are sometimes often missing from these figures, it's actually fairly easy to find them because these are exactly the same missiles that which came with the 1992 AH-74 Desert Apache helicopter for the Sonic Fighters line. So there are plenty of these floating around. They're not necessarily for um, heavy duty. For some strange reason, they were molded in, in the same bright green color. So you can just add those to this figure and you're fine. Tour of you. Actually, let me take you a look. One of these rockets. <laughs> Whoops, that was a dud. We actually fairly close to. Um, yeah, that's not Rampart. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind-the-scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video, and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s GI Joe tour review. See you then.